Welcome, Professor Samira. Today we have Natalie Smolensky with us. The recording we did the other day didn't work out that well. So we're doing another recording today with her in Santiago de Chile. And so there will be no questions from other people. My voice doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> but Natalie will be doing a presentation and I'll ask some questions during the presentation, maybe, and at the end of the presentation too. And yeah, let me. Welcome today. No questions in the middle, but we have at least a nice recording because we have a good internet connection. As always, this presentation will be shared with the CC by SA license. Our objective is to create a global SSI community so that you, you can reuse this material. And Natalie has been so kind to share this material with, with you today here. And also, you will be able to listen to her insights about the sovereignty and historical context, which is really important to understand the basics of where SSI is coming from. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, in Chile, actually, for the Latin America Bitcoin and Blockchain Conference. So I think this is the perfect occasion uh, to record a little bit of historical background to a concept that has been profoundly influential in um, cryptocurrency circles, um, as well as in digital identity circles. Um, these two applications of blockchain technology are, are um, perhaps um, the low hanging fruit. Um, in other words, the applications of blockchain that are most immediately um, available and most readily show value. Um, and so I think it's worth it for us to spend a little bit of time thinking about what sovereignty means, what it has meant. Um, I'm going to focus in this presentation on the European um, political tradition. Of course, there are many different ways of understanding sovereignty um, across different cultural contexts, um, but this particular um, cultural context is the one I'm most familiar with in my work as an anthropologist and historian, um, and it has profoundly informed the trajectory of political theory um, in the 20th and 21st centuries. So um, with that, I will begin with the question of what is sovereignty? So this is the question that is animating this presentation. Um, answering, asking and answering this question sets us up for a longer term, more in-depth study um, into the notions of self um, and then into the combined notions of self-sovereignty, um, which I'll examine in the last installation um, of my project. But um, asking the question, what is sovereignty first, I think sets, a, sets us up with a solid foundation. So um, in my view, um, Sovereignty is a theory about the nature and derivation of power in human societies. Uh, this combines both um, the contemporary dictionary definitions of sovereignty, which we'll examine in a few minutes, um, as well as the ways that sovereignty has been written about throughout the medieval uh, and early modern period. Um, so traditionally, theories of sovereignty have been used to account for state power. Um, so states have generally been assumed um, to be sovereign actors, sovereign historical actors. Um, however, states are not the only actors who exercise sovereignty. Um, as we'll see in a moment, um, other actors include uh, churches, city-states, uh, families, um, and most recently, individuals. Um, and so when we talk about sovereignty, we're actually talking about a generalizable concept um, that doesn't only apply to the realm of statecraft, um, but also to other forms um, of power and authority. So sovereignty, uh, if sovereignty is a, a theory about the nature and derivation of power in human societies, um, how have states traditionally claimed they derive their sovereignty? Uh, generally, when you probe deep enough, you find that uh, most states claim their sovereignty derives from some transcendental ideal. Um, and I'm using the word transcendental in a social scientific sense right now. I'm not referring to transcendental meditation or new age spirituality or anything like that. I'm talking about um, ideals like gods, uh, justice with a capital J, law, or uh, the will of the people, um, which are frequently uh, assumed to kind of penetrate or trickle down into uh, the material realm. 
Um, so this this already um, uh, this already forms a type of uh, cosmology, right? Um, so if you're talking about transcendence, generally you have some notion of imminence, um, and you're making a distinction, um, a hierarchical distinction between the two. Um, and so often what you'll find is um, that there is a there is violent contestation. Um, between uh, uh, different political parties who would claim that on a transcendental basis, some imminent earthly authority is illegitimate uh, or invalid. Um, so sovereignty, you know, because there's the slippage between the transcendental and the imminent, sovereignty is characterized by uh, both identity and difference between the source of power and the instrument that wields that power. Um, so uh, if the king derives his power from God, um, the question arises, well, to what extent is the king like God and to what extent is the king different from God? And so over here on the right hand side, what you see um, is a set of coins. These are ancient Roman coins um, that are likening the Roman emperor to a deity. Um, so here you're seeing uh, Hercules. Um, and then in these two coins, uh, you're seeing Sol Invictus or the sun god. Um, so this is Emperor Constantine um, showing himself to be a twin or double of the sun god. And you'll notice that it, in all of these coins, uh, the, god, it, the god's appearance is likened to the appearance of the emperor, not the other way around. Um, and so there, there's a very close connection um, in Roman theology between the emperor and the god. Um, and so this overlap of tension uh, between the source of power and the instrument that wields that power has given rise to violent political contestation um, throughout human history about um, what exactly are the differences um, between this imminent realm and this transcendental realm that ostensibly justifies it. So I want to take a few steps back into the medieval era um, to talk about where some of our uh, contemporary political theology derives from. Um, and I've, I've already hearkened to the ancient Roman world, um, but of course uh, in Europe um, in particular, uh, the Christian tradition has had uh, a deep uh, impact on how legitimate political authority is constituted. And this particular verse, in Paul's letter to the Romans has been frequently cited by authoritarian regimes, um, including by the Nazi party, appealing to um, the derivation of earthly power from God's authority. Um, so Paul says, let everyone sub be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Uh, just for emphasis, in case you didn't catch it the first time. Now, there's been uh, a lot of theological debate about what this letter means. Um, many have interpreted it as a politically quietistic document, that this is Paul, in effect, uh, telling the early Christian community to um, tone down its anti-government uh, radicalism uh, and to submit to the authority of the Caesar. Others have taken a more radical uh, interpretation and said that Paul was actually, if you read between the lines, um, implicitly saying that um, the emperor uh, actually has no divine authority. In fact, is fundamentally illegitimate um, theologically, um, and that obedience is merely uh, a kind of outward uh, camouflage or sign um, a coping strategy to deal with the fact that um, we do not yet inhabit uh, something like the kingdom of God or some um, utopian uh, salvific end state. Um, there are lots of interpretations of this, but for medieval political theologians, um, it was it, uh, it was very often interpreted as a, uh, a political authority justifying tract. Um, so. This example is particularly important because it takes it takes this verse um, and it's and it um, it makes a distinct a distinction uh, between uh, the actual human emperor occupying the throne and the emperor as a kind of transcendental ideal. 
Um, so the Norman Anonymous um, was a monk writing around the, the year 100. Um, he, he was a political theologian, uh, very much uh, arguing for the supremacy of emperors over all other forms of uh, earthly political authority. And so he wrote, um, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and did not say unto Tiberius the things that are Tiberius's. So uh, the Norman Anonymous is quoting Jesus here. He's quoting the Gospels. Uh, render to the power, potestas, not to the person. The person is worth nothing, but the power is just. Iniquitous is Tiberius, but good is the Caesar. So this may sound as though um, he's making a claim about a fundamental difference between the office and the person inhabiting that office. Uh, but in fact, he's not. Um, he is rather hearkening to this um, ancient Roman ideal uh, that power is the property of the nature of a thing. Um, so uh, by that logic, as, as all power comes from God, uh, the powerful partake of the nature of God. Um, so the Norman Anonymous argued that human kings are, are deified by the grace of the sacraments and power is conferred liturgically um, and that kings accordingly have this dual nature. They, they are both human and divine at the same time. Um, so I just did a pause because I, I don't want to just yeah. not go to what we have. Sorry, I forgot to yeah. click that. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to close Slack. I don't know why it's probably not. Okay. But I it. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, um, so why is Norman Anonymous um, likening kings to God? Um, well, the context for this tract is something called the investiture struggle, which was a major medieval uh, power struggle between popes and emperors over which type of ruler had supreme political authority. Uh, it was sparked initially by Pope Gregory VII, who initiated a series of far-reaching uh, church reforms. Um, he basically came in and said, I'm going to clean up corruption in the church. Um, I'm going to uh, prevent all kinds of abuses of office. And those include not only abuses of church offices, like um, bishops uh, and popes, but also of all of the princes and kings who are competing with the church uh, for political power. And so Gregory VII insisted that the only person in the world with the right to appoint bishops is the Pope. Um, in his Dictatus Pape, uh, published in 1075, he declared this. this. This, of course, did not sit well with emperors. It triggered a 50-year conflict between the papacy and kings. Uh, and Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV was the most egregious um, in fighting the popes on this. He was excommunicated four times. Um, at one point, um, he, uh, he came begging uh, with a hair shirt and bare feet in the middle of winter uh, to the Pope's palace to, to seek forgiveness, um, got forgiveness, and then promptly was excommunicated again. Um, so this was one of those like soap operas that just went on um, for uh, an entire generation and was eventually uh, resolved by the Concordat of Worms um, in the early 12th century. This was kind of this was kind of a, a a peace treaty, if you will, between uh, kings and the church. It didn't really make the conflict go away. Um, it just prevented further violence. <laughs> um, so, uh, as a pragmatic agreement, uh, they decided emperors could no longer appoint bishops, um, but they could preside over elections. They could make appointments in the case of disputes and invest bishops with power by the lance. Um, bishops also carried military obligation or fealty to kings. Um, and again, this, this takes us back to the fact that there wasn't a really big difference between kingdoms and the church in this era. The church had its own uh, standing armies, it waged war, um, it inhabited um, or was characterized by a feudal structure uh, of fealty and vassalage. Uh, and so it really was a case of um, twin powers competing with each other 
rather than as we think of it today, um, you know, uh, the secular state versus the religious church. So the 12th century um, also saw the reintroduction of Roman law uh, into Western Europe. The importance of this for the development of the political um, and legal tradition really can't be overstated. Um, and by Roman law, what we really mean is um, Justinian, uh, Emperor Justinian's rewriting of, of the entirety of Roman law, which was completed under his decree in the sixth century. Uh, and this, this four-part book was called the Corpus Juris Civilis. Um, and it, uh, it constitutes uh, the foundation documents of the Western legal tradition. One of the precepts um, found in, in the Corpus Juris Civilis was not the prince rules, but justice through the prince. And so now we have this, we have this reintroduction of a transcendental ideal of justice, um, which is in effect ruling uh, through the prince. <clears throat> So um, the uh, Roman law, um, along with the Bible, um, with the writings of the church fathers, papal decretals, um, acts of church councils and synods, all of this together uh, was uh, compiled by the 12th century canon lawyer from Bologna, Italy, called Gratian, into something known as the Decretum Gratiani. Um, and this was the foundation of canon law, so church law, um, within the Roman Church until 1918. Um, so if you think about that, I mean, from the 12th century until the 20th century, um, we, we basically, uh, the Roman Church had a unified body uh, of reference um, that it was using to, to craft its institutional tradition. Um, but uh, Gratian's Decretum didn't only influence uh, church law, it also had a profound influence on the laws of the nascent European states that were just uh, being developed at this time. So, um, so that was just a, a brief aside about the significance of Roman law for the foundation documents of the European legal tradition. Um, Moving into uh, the, uh, the later 12th century, we start to see philosophers um, really taking some of the precepts of Roman law and their interpretations via a canon law um, and writing political treatises on, on these topics. So um, John of Salisbury was a famous 12th century uh, English philosopher. He eventually became Bishop of Chartres. Um, he wrote a, a book called uh, Polycraticus, um, and in this book, he postulated that the prince is both above the law and a serf of the law. Um, and you'll notice he cites these two different personas of the prince. So the prince is a persona publica, which is a transcendental type of person um, that is collective, um, that is sacred, that endures through time. Um, and the prince is also a persona voluntans, so an individual human being, uh, no different in principle from any other human being. Um, and in this way, the prince is the image of justice. So um, one emperor who really took this legal theory uh, to heart and made it a pillar of statecraft um, was Frederick II, uh, 13th century Holy Roman Emperor, um, he had a fascinating life. Um, he fought in the Crusades. Um, he engendered a lasting peace with the Egyptian Sultan and Medic of Kamen. Um, he uh, had uh, many, many uh, love affairs and children and um, was also in constant conflict with the popes. Um, but uh, one of his lasting legacies um, is that he produced a collection of Sicilian constitutions uh, written by his legal team, uh, led by Petrus de Venea, uh, called the Liber Augustalis. And these, um, these constitutions, and, and you'll notice this word appearing now, revive the foundational narrative of, uh, of the Roman Republic, wherein sovereignty was actually initially uh, conferred onto the prince by Roman quirites uh, or citizens. And this practice of conferring sovereignty by citizens was called lex regia. Um, the emperor, on the other hand, was lex animata, the living law, 
Um, and we start to see these analogies where the emperor is the father and the son of justice, just as Christ is both the father and the son of Mary. Um, and this is why Frederick was able to declare himself free from laws, um, completely legally unaccountable, um, but bound by reason, which is a transcendental ideal here. So um, we, we're, we're slowly starting to see the emergence of a notion that law is sovereign. Um, and uh, the, the uh, notions that were introduced in the Sicilian constitutions, um, we see recapitulated in 13th century uh, tract by Henry of Bracton on the laws and customs of England. Um, Bracton was an English jurist. Um, he argued that the king is in fact bound by natural law, which at this time meant divine law. Um, there wasn't a separation between the two concepts. Um, but this binding actually confers upon the king extraordinary rights and powers. Um, and so Bracton uses the example of the quirites um, or the Roman citizens to stress the constitutionality of the king's absolute power. Um, however, we see this interesting uh, kind of doublespeak here in Bracton because he also says, he recapitulates this old notion that what has pleased the prince's law, um, which was a common maxim um, throughout uh, the European kingdoms. Um, but then Henry defines it more precisely. So what has pleased the prince's law, that is not what has been rashly presumed by the personal will of the king, but what has been rightly defined by the concilium of his magnates, by the king's authorization, and after deliberation and conference concerning it. So, now we're talking about magnates and a concilium um, and deliberation and conference. So what exactly does this mean? Um, well, Bracton was writing in the context of another major medieval struggle, the 13th century baronial wars um, of, of England. So three unpopular English kings, John, Henry III, and Edward I uh, faced multiple rebellions from the baronial class. Um, their grievances included uh, their indebtedness, uh, lack of due process for um, judicial uh, claims, onerous and arbitrary taxation, uh, and a growing royal monopoly on forest use. And remember, at this time, the forest was, was like your um, mine for raw materials. And so there's tons of competition um, between different um, stakeholders uh, over um, forest use. Um, and finally, that they perceived uh, that the king kept encroaching on the rights of the church and on the rights of the free cities. And so finally, when they realized that, the, that King John had no interest in um, addressing any of their grievances, um, they launched a rebellion, which became the first of basically a century of ongoing rebellions. Um, the first rebellion also um, ended up producing the Magna Carta. So the Magna Carta was actually drafted as a peace treaty to enshrine baronial rights vis-a-vis -vis the king and end the wars. Um, it didn't really work. The king didn't really follow anything that was written in the Magna Carta. And there wasn't a way um, in, the, in the legal tradition or the political theology at the time to really hold the king accountable. And so what ended up happening was more wars. Um, eventually though, the, uh, the barons um, coalesced around a council, uh, which was established to uh, really for one purpose, and those were to approve any additional taxation that the king wanted to levy beyond the traditional feudal obligations um, of fealty uh, to the king. Um, and so we, we start to see this difference now um, emerge between um, feudal obligations which are relations of personal loyalty um, and servitude and hierarchy, um, and the acts of state, namely making war. Um, so the first English parliament was, was actually born out of this, um, out of this emerging distinction. Uh, one of the iterations of the Magna Carta, because with, with every new rebellion, the Magna Carta was rewritten and reapproved. Um, one of the additions of this stipulated that although cases could not be brought against the king, they could be brought against his officers 
um, who were accountable to the treaties the king had signed by will of the king. Um, so again, this distinction begins to emerge between um, what has pleased the prince um, and the law. So um, this split between the feudal um, and uh, the acts and property of the state began to widen in the late uh, Middle Ages. And by feudal, uh, as uh, I explained a minute ago, this refers really to the king's private property and private interpersonal relationships. Whereas um, what is fiscal referred to the property of the state. Um, and the fisc, as it was called, um, became eventually the crown. So this abstractive notion of kingship that cannot die. Um, so while the individual king might die, the crown never dies. Um, the crown is the res publica, the, the public thing. Um, and much like um, the church, it is, uh, public, it's communal, it's holy, and its property is inalienable. Um, so we see the early theory of the state um, in early modern Europe um, actually grow out of the uh, theology of the church. So uh, church property was uh, consider considered uh, res sacre, so uh, a sacred thing. It is eternal. It belongs either to no one or to God. Uh, res nullius, and it may never be alienated. Um, and to this day, the, the church actually uses this argument um, to justify reclamation of all of its previous historical territory that has been confiscated by various states at various times. Whereas um, state property uh, is res quasi sacre, so it is also eternal. It also belongs to no one. Um, rather than God, it belongs to the fisc which is a semi-divine notion. Um, and it also may never be alienated. Um, and, and so this, this notion actually appears as early as Gratian in his Decretum, uh, where he says, hoc tollit fiscus, quod non acceptis, accepted Christus. Uh, in other words, what is not received by Christ uh, or the church is extracted by the fiscus, the state. And this became kind of a legal like bon mot or um, maxim that jurists would repeat over and over again throughout the Middle Ages. So this leads us to the question, is sovereignty unitary or plural? Um, the image on the right, of course, is the classic um, cover of the Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes's early modern treatise on the state, um, in which he's literally representing the sovereign as the uh, mystical body politic. Um, so we're seeing here this push towards a totalizing notion of sovereignty. And yet there's the state and there's the church. And by the time Hobbes was writing, there were competing churches, um, each of which claimed universal sovereignty over the course of human salvation. Um, there were multiple emperors and kings um, competing over sovereign claims within their territorial jurisdictions. Um, and they also laid claim to salvific roles. So in uh, ap apocalyptic literature, which was very popular throughout um, the Middle Ages and, and remains very popular today, um, emperors always had um, some central role in like the end times narrative. Uh, cities, neighborhoods, and families were also considered sovereign in different ways. And depending on where you lived, different religious and economic groups living under the same king or emperor were able to formulate and practice their own laws. Um, so all of these forms of sovereignty coexisted. Um, and this, of course, led to lots of confusion and lots of violence. So when we move into the modern period, we, we notice something interesting about the definition of sovereignty. Um, that now sovereignty is defined as supreme power, especially over a body politic, and freedom from external control, so total autonomy. Um, and if we look at a dictionary of international law, we see that this is um, supreme authority within a territory, and that there are three defining principles of sovereignty, territorial jurisdiction, immunity, and non-intervention. Now, these notions grew out of, um, they largely derived from the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, 
which ended the horrific Thirty Years' War in 1648. So all of these um, medieval notions of sovereignty, where you know it wasn't clear who had the greater um, greater claims to authority in different contexts, which church um, could speak for which population, um, this resulted in a horrific uh, Thirty Years' War. Um, we, you know, we don't really have this at the forefront of historical memory anymore today, but um, it was, it was pretty much as devastating as the Second World War was uh, to the European continent. A third of the people in um, the region that today is modern Germany uh, were wiped out. Um, so this is, this is like, you know, Black Plague level death. Um, and it was, it was fundamentally a conflict about the constitution of the state. Um, so this led to um, this more unitary notion of sovereignty, where states notionally have full sovereignty within their territorial jurisdictions. Um, so if I'm France, I can't meddle in the uh, internal affairs of Germany. Um, and even if state power is divided between uh, different branches or different um, uh, sovereign actors, it is divided within a single political regime. Um, this unification of the state has afforded it historically unprecedented power. So states today are more powerful than they have ever been at any time in human history. Um, despite all the lofty rhetoric of early states about emperors being gods um, and parading around with all sorts of um, uh, regalry and uh, pomp and circumstance, um, a lot of that was um, sort of bluster to cover over really how weak the state was um, historically. Today, the state is extraordinarily powerful. Um, and some of that power is anticipated in the theories of early modern uh, political thinkers, including Jean Baudin, uh, Thomas Hobbes, whom you've mentioned already, but also Machiavelli, Rousseau, uh, and then of course in the 20th century, the uh, Nazi uh, political theorist, Carl Schmitt. So, um, you know, these early modern political thinkers, um, they, they were not dumb. I mean, they knew that there was no such thing as truly absolute power. And so um, what did they think were the limits to unitary sovereignty? Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of them um, here to give you a general sense for their thinking. Uh, Machiavelli, um, he, he really was a theorist of the independent and self-determining political entity. So he was coming from um, a medieval uh, political culture where city-states, um, particularly in, in Northern Italy, they, they were constantly at war. Um, there was constant struggle between princes um, of these different city-states. Um, and so he was, uh, had a front row seat to um, the turnover of power. Uh, over and over and over again. <clears throat> and so his kind of ideal was um, a sovereign state that knew how to persevere and protect its sovereignty through time. Um, and he, he theorized very pragmatically, uh, like, look, people want to moralize about sovereignty. Um, but ultimately, the only thing that sovereignty is limited by is inevitable ill fortune. Eventually, something bad's going to happen and by the power of other sovereigns. So only fortuna uh, and power can check power. And this notion that only power can check power um, became the underpinning of uh, Montesquieu's um, theory of uh, the division of uh, power um, in, in branches of government. So uh, sovereigns in Machiavelli's view, they need to establish their independence as quickly as they can and maintain it for as long as they can because most sovereignty is gonna come to an end sooner rather than later. So get it while you can and keep it as long as you can. And that's it. I mean, his theory is, um, is a series of, of treaty, treatises on um, how to become and remain sovereign um, as long as possible. Um, and there's and there's actually a, a lot of this that that could apply, for example, to the modern corporation, um, which is uh, very similar in many ways to the medieval city state. <clears throat> so what limits the unitary sovereign um, in Grotius's view? Uh, Hugo Grotius was, um, of course, a Dutch theorist. Uh, he laid the groundwork for what later became international law, um, he was asked to, in effect, 
create from nothing, uh, from scratch, uh, a legal framework to resolve disputes between European colonial powers who got in fights in uh, colonial territories. So um, the uh, Dutch East India Company, for example, uh, when it got uh, in, into a conflict uh, off the coast of Indonesia with Spain. Um, what court and what set of laws could possibly adjudicate this entirely new legal uh, situation? So he went back to uh, natural law, um, which he was interpreting through the lens of Roman law, uh, and saw in natural law a set of general moral principles to which all people assent. And these include a right to self-defense, a right to pu punish those who have done one wrong, um, and a right to reward those who have treated one well. Um, so the, the Roman notions of use naturale, um, natural law, um, which refers to kind of this fundamental pan-human morality, and then use gentium, which is, uh, refers more to the common law or the actually practiced law uh, of many peoples. Um, these were his attempts to formulate the first expressions um, of a transnational law that did not rely explicitly on Christian moral and legal precepts. Um, which was uh, very important for um, a, a European Christian world that was beginning to become aware of just the scope um, and scale uh, of non-Christian humanity beyond the borders of Europe. Uh, he, he also drew parallels between individual and national sovereignty. And so here we kind of see some of the, um, some of the roots of self-sovereignty slowly start to emerge. Uh, so John Locke um, was an English theorist. Um, he argued that sovereignty is actually self-limiting. Um, and it's not self-limiting because, you know, uh, people are good by nature, but um, because by nature humans are social. And so they will naturally enter into social contracts with one another, um, much in the way that Adam Smith was theorizing that you know, markets emerge naturally because humans um, naturally truck and barter with one another. Locke was saying they naturally form um, social communities which are uh, reciprocal. So it's actually a two-way social contract between a sovereign um, and the people over which the sovereign rules. Um, and he used the notion of the deed, that sovereign people are deeding some of their natural rights, which they continue to retain, to a sovereign who rules by their consent. And if that sovereign is unjust, the people may take back those deeded rights and appeal to heaven for a new ruler. Um, the sovereign, uh, and here's where you know, Locke's uh, political theology comes in. Um, the sovereign moder models themselves on God who has limitless power, but binds himself only to will and to do what is good. Um, so you know, this, this is definitely a view of a benevolent God. Um, and in this way, both parties to the social contract self-limit their sovereignty. Um, and then of course there's Montesquieu. So um, Montesquieu didn't really, um, uh, in his main notion of the separation of powers, it's not so much that sovereignty has to be limited by the separation of powers. In fact, in most cases it isn't, but it should be. So it's a normative argument. Without the separation of powers, there's no effective check on the abuse of sovereign power. And Montesquieu proposed that this separation um, of powers be into three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. Um, and he based this model on the constitution of the Roman Republic, as well as the nascent British constitutional system, which was just forming in this period. So um, returning to this notion of constitutionalism, uh, often today, when we hear the word constitution, we understand that to mean uh, limited power of the sovereign, uh, checks and balances, separation of powers, um, but it, it doesn't actually uh, have to be that. It doesn't have to be any of those things. Rather, a constitution is simply um, a, a, a framework for governance. Um, ideally drafted by representatives of a sovereign entity who are considered legitimate, but there are also plenty of constitutions that are imposed from outside, like the constitution of Iraq uh, post-war, which was drafted by uh, legal scholars from the United States. Um, so the constitution um, could be considered sovereign, 
in that the powers and responsibilities of state actors derive from it and are in principle limited by it. Um, but if the authority from which a constitution derives its legitimacy, um, and that could be any transcendental ideal like God or heaven or a more imminent ideal like the people or the governed, um, that may be considered sovereign. Um, and so if there's a discrepancy between uh, where uh, people believe the constitution to derive its power and then um, its actual contents, that sets us up for a constitutional crisis. Um, constitutionalism can also absolutely enshrine absolute sovereignty. Um, so if we think back to Henry Bracton's um, treatise on uh, the law of the English nation, um, you know, he, he defined the king's power as uh, limited by law, but also that very same law um, gives the king absolute power um, and uh, in effect uh, makes him immune um, from direct uh, legal prosecution. Um, and so this type of Bractonian constitutionalism uh, is actually more common than we would think. Um, uh, in the modern period, uh, Nazi Germany f famously, uh, the parliament passed the Enabling Act, um, a constitutional amendment that allowed the executive branch to make laws bypassing parliament, um, doing away with the separation of powers. Uh, and pretty much everywhere, we see some version of the doctrine of the state of exception, which allows state actors to suspend constitutional limits to their power, uh, ostensibly when extraordinary measures are required to preserve the existence or integrity of the state. Um, now, uh, as many of us uh, have, have come to realize in, in the post-Snowden age, what begin as states of exception frequently become new norms and laws, establishing enduring extra-constitutional rule by powerful state actors. So um, what does this mean for sovereignty today? Um, one of the first questions this tradition raises is, you know, does, does sovereignty refer to power alone um, or does it also entail some notion of responsibility? Um, in other words, does sovereignty carry a moral imperative in addition to a characteristic of autonomous authority over a jurisdiction? Um, and in, in the, uh, uh, well, in, in numerous um, religious uh, traditions, um, but also in, in the Christian theological tradition we've been discussing in this presentation, there is this notion that the sovereign is obligated to provide for the common good. And if the sovereign um, ceases to do so, they've in effect forfeited um, their mandate. Um, this notion of sovereignty as a kind of responsibility doesn't get enshrined in the Peace of Westphalia, but it persists in political theory, in national constitutions, in religious traditions, as well as in non-religious ethical thought. Um, and historically, it's been connected to justice and just war doctrines. Now, um, responsibility sounds great, but um, what it actually means in practice is often uh, strongly overdetermined by the interests of powerful actors. Um, so, you know, one of the primary justifications for the invasion of Iraq, for example, um, were the human rights abuses um, perpetuated by Saddam Hussein's uh, regime. Um, and to, today, you know, some humanitarian interventionists argue that heads of state can default on their sovereignty um, if they egregiously and co consistently violate human rights. And this notion of human rights is uh, can be thought of as a 20th century um, a secularized evolution of the notion of natural law. So this approach has been called contingent sovereignty. Um, it is definitely not a part of the Westphalian notion of sovereignty. The United Nations Charter doesn't allow uh, humanitarian exceptions to the principle of non-intervention. Um, the Security Council is allowed to militarily intervene um, against a state but only if that state makes a threat to the peace of other states. Um, and even then the targeted state retains the right to self-defense. Um, so it's, it's very much um, <laughs> unconcerned with what is going on within the borders of any particular nation um, due to that principle of immunity and the principle of non-intervention. So um, contingent sovereignty raises profound questions who arbitrates whether the sovereign has failed to secure the public good, uh, 
and on what basis, um, or who arbitrates whether the sovereign has violated law, justice, or reason, and on what basis, what measures may, may then be taken against the sovereign. These are ongoing questions that are being uh, worked out in real time through institutions like the International Criminal Court, um, but also through uh, direct warfare. So um, coming to a close, I just wanted to leave you with a few takeaways. Um, th these, are, these next questions can kind of help us segue into the next installment um, of, um, uh, of the series, which looks at the question of self. Um, so if not necessarily through governance vehicles like a constitution or separation of powers, on what basis does a sovereign state cohere? Um, and what implications does this coherence have for the sovereignty of non-state actors? Um, so uh, I propose here, um, and I'm not gonna delve into this um, too deeply here because this is kind of set up for the next presentation, um, but I would say that principles of sovereign cohesion um, coalesce around these three, war, property, and currency. Um, this is not to say these are, this is an exhaustive, exhaustive list of the functions of the state. Rather, um, they are the conditions for an entity like a state to meaningfully emerge and endure over time. Um, so Hegel, um, the philosopher Hegel famously said that uh, war tests whether the state can hold as a sovereign collective, um, that sovereignty is only meaningful if it is recognized and that war is the vehicle for that recognition. Um, which certainly was um, reflecting his experience in, in the European uh, political tradition, where the Treaty of, of Westphalia um, concluded um, 30 years of war and resulted in the recognition of these nascent states by one another. Property. So we, we've talked about the Fisk. Um, the Fisk started out um, in the early medieval period, uh, like the Carolingian period, as the personal property of the king, and slowly over time became um, the disembodied collective eternal property of the crown or the commonwealth. Um, and that names the collective body of territory, real estate reserves, and balance sheet that defines the body politic. So when we talk about GDP, we're talking about the FISC. When we talk about um, national income, we're talking about uh, the FISC. When we talk about um, uh, national debt, when we talk about a country's investment position, um, these are all um, uh, tied to the notion of the state as an owner of property. And then currency. So the existence and functioning of the state must be financed. If the state finances itself largely uh, through taxation, um, then this taxation has to be paid in some uh, form of currency that the state legally recognizes. Um, and the value of that currency then has a direct impact on the purchasing power of the state. Um, so states have uh, historically minted their own currencies. Um, they have also historically devalued their own currencies um, to in inflate them um, as their expenses grow. Um, so, uh, and, and what is the primary state activity financed uh, by taxation or, or by uh, currency inflation? Um, historically, it's been war. Um, so we circle back again to the first principle of sovereign cohesion. Um, this is still a work in progress. I'm still uh, thinking through many of these questions, but I just wanted to share with you the current state of my thinking uh, and invite you to follow the project, um, to connect with me, uh, and to send me any questions that you have um, in retrospect. Thank you. Great, uh, Madeline. Thank you so much. I think this is a great background. I have a couple of questions. Yeah. <coughs> it's my voice. <laughs> um, what are the next phases of this project that you're working on? Yeah, so the next phase is going to look at um, the historical evolution of the self. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third phase um, combines the two concepts, sovereignty and self, and looks at self-sovereignty in recent historical context. Okay, and um, you know, you will probably explain it in, in future more, in more detail. Um, how, how useful or how correct is the, is the use of the term of, of sovereignty or self-sovereign in the context of SSI from your point of view? Yeah, um, I think um, the meaning is currently highly contested. Um, and 
I'm particularly interested in the contestation happening around the ownership implications of self-sovereignty. So we talk a lot about things like data ownership. What does that mean in practice? Um, and this is why I think going back to the principles of sovereign cohesion um, is useful, because what does it mean really for a state to own something also? Um, that is often unclear. Um, so I'm using this as a departure point to, um, to answer your question about um, the utility of the term. Um, and I'll also add to that that the utility of the term self-sovereignty um, needs to be understood, I think, by discipline as well. Um, so within law, um, there is um, property has a certain set of inherited meanings, depending on which legal tradition you're talking about. Within um, philosophy um, or critical theory, property um, has a different set of uh, interpretive traditions. Um, and so what I'm interested in is actually looking at the conditions for thinking about self-sovereignty from multiple angles technological, legal, um, and kind of philosophical, social. Okay, and you talked about money before. Uh, in fact, I found it really fascinating. Uh, we had a bit of in, in Chile. So, I mean, uh, the idea of Satoshi Nakamoto was really about creating a money managed by the people yeah. and not managed by state. But many people argue that the state will heavily refuse to, to lose the power of managing the currency because it's a key tool, a key political tool right. for some sort of survival. How do you see that? Yeah, well, we are already seeing states um, respond to the threat of Bitcoin um, by uh, issuing centralized cryptocurrencies, um, often through sovereign banks or central banks. Um, and, and so the states are absolutely trying to preempt um, this threat. I think um, right now we're still very early um, and so it, it's hard to tell, you know, long term uh, how quickly uh, decentralized stateless um, currencies like Bitcoin will begin to erode at um, the power of fiat currencies. Um, I would argue, though, that um, it, it's an inevitability, uh, not not because, you know, even states are necessarily good or bad, um, because, you know, it, there are different ways that people organize themselves and make collective decisions. Um, and, and those often um, meet important um, historical needs. Um, but um, the, uh, the value of a decentralized, borderless, um, permissionless, censorship resistant um, currency is that it allows for a kind of globalization of, um, of trade and community that um, the nation state system has actually become an obstacle and an impediment to. Um, and so there will be, I think, a coexistence for a very long time um, of, of fiat currencies with these de decentralized cryptocurrencies and people using them for different use cases and purposes. Great, thank you so much. This was great. I think it gives a great background. <coughs> we will be um, doing more shows very soon. Why today? It doesn't work. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you so much, Natalie, and I'll run works again. And um, I hope we will be able to do more, more of these shows with you. And thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Alex.